What up, guys and girls? It's Bobby. And Sean. Coming at you a little bit delayed this week for our weekly episode of the Cronus Cast. This week's episode is brought to you guys by Paragon Recovery. Check out their website. Uh, use the code Cronus for 15% off. Highly recommend their Night Gain supplement as well as their Flame Off supplement. Great supplements uh, that I've been definitely using a lot since I've been running more. Uh, check them out. Really good company. Great group of guys. Great product. Yeah, that, that supplement stuff is really good for all the cardio that we're going to be hitting. Yeah, I've, uh, I've actually been surprisingly not feeling bad with my runs because I'm up to like about 35 a week ish with my runs. But that, they're actually like uh, not like my body feels pretty good, surprisingly. That's awesome. And you just celebrated a birthday and you ran what, 30K? Yeah, so Saturday was my 30th birthday. And usually I like to do a birthday workout. Usually my birthday workout is uh, back squat 225 for age. So this year would have been 225 for 30. Uh, but, you know, with the whole pandemic thing, gyms are closed. So I don't have the access to go squat. So I did 30K instead. That's awesome. How'd it feel? Uh, not too bad. I actually did it uh, fasted. So I didn't, didn't eat breakfast. Uh, didn't eat anything during the run. Only drank like a 500 mil bottle of water with like a hydration tab in it, uh, like a mile nine, but that's about that's all I did. So um, I, I don't know, felt pretty good. I was actually pretty surprised that I didn't have to like uh, do any nutrition or really hydrate it during it. I felt pretty good at the end. That's great. So for the listeners out there, when they do really long distance stuff, uh, how did you recover from that? Did you do stretching? Did you eat a bigger meal? How did you load your carbs, etc.? So usually the, the night before a longer run, uh, like long run for me is like hour plus. I try to carb up a little bit at night. Usually like about 50 grams of carbs the night before or like 50, 100. I try and carb up a little bit because I like to do all my runs fasted because um, I've been doing a little bit of research and pretty much there's been some data that shows there's good uh, results from doing uh, a training a training low and competing high essentially like training at a low uh, carb state and then competing at a high carb state so that way you get the benefit of the carbohydrates uh, so that you're able to run a little bit faster so I, uh, I did it all fasted but typically I'll try and f- uh, carb a little bit more the night before and then I just fast during my runs and after my runs I'll do a little cool down stretch and then um Usually about at, at nighttime, I like to do my like 30 minutes of stretching every night or so. 30 minutes to an hour of stretching every night. That's awesome. I've been doing a lot of stretching since moving to the city. Uh, yesterday, went on a run in Central Park. Way more hilly than I had imagined. Oh, yeah? And got back and had a good, like, about maybe 20-minute stretch and then mm-hmm. lifted in the apartment a little bit uh, after that. But now I'm looking at, like, supplements because I'll be doing some brick workouts with the Ironman prep. Um, and when I need to ingest the carbs, like how many carbs per hour I can even digest, um, and switching more to like a fat burning diet, uh, so that I'm not crashing on, you know, like some four to eight hour workouts that I'll have coming up. Yeah. It was kind of surprising. Like I thought I was going to like hit a wall or like bonk a lot sooner, but I didn't really start feeling it or hitting the wall until like mile 14 or 15. Like my pace was still fine. Like I had the same pace when I started like hitting the wall a little bit. But it uh, was just a little bit harder mentally because I, I just had to concentrate more about, like, staying with my pace. Does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely does. I, I tell you what, the couple halves that I've run, uh, fortunately, I don't think that's a distance where you really hit a wall. Mm-hmm. Um, but my walls have always been mental, just being so bored. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about it before with having music uh, that can help fuel you or, um, you know, some other... Uh, motivation that you, you connect into digitally, whether it's a podcast, uh, but in gear, gearing up for you know these Ironman races, you're not allowed to have music. But I, I'm so beyond bored running anything more than 13 miles. You're like I don't know what more to focus on. Like you can only chase so many rabbits midway through a race, and so I don't know. That's one of those things that I, I still dislike distance running because you can't coast on a bike. You can't really just coast and glide on a swim. You're just pounding pavement. Yeah, I know for like me personally, um, I usually I usually have something playing in the background. 
and for me it's been audiobooks i like to do a lot of audiobooks i like to like learn while i'm trying to do something uh running but i do notice that when i'm like when it's tough or when i'm like not at like a zone three or higher i typically don't even hear the music or hear the podcast or the audiobook it's just like noise and i'm just like concentrating more on like i don't know just my running i guess but definitely yeah, because too i'm definitely like paying attention to what i'm listening to what's really hard too as soon as you start increasing your steps per minute if that bpm on the song isn't really matching up mm -hmm. then it almost becomes more of an annoyance i, I remember a couple of times uh on the runner i'd be doing intervals in the winter and i'd be just pissed off if music came on that was too slow mm -hmm. because it's distracting me from maintaining my cadence my breathing you know listening to like some great weezer song and then you're like all right this doesn't translate to you know zone four zone five threshold type stuff and yeah. it was really annoying yeah I, f I feel like uh if i was to do like higher pace like tempo stuff i would not listen to anything i think that's like more you should be you should be i think more aware at that point whereas if you're doing like, like zone two like aerobic style stuff you don't really have to be like super present at that point you're just kind of building up mileage yeah one of the things too that uh I, i've done significantly more of in the last couple of years and it's going to be the basis for the programming going forward but uh, zone training and how you measure heart rates differently uh with the exercises so like a uh, zone two for me might top out at like 140 mm -hmm. but a zone two on my swim is probably more likely around 130 125 uh, same with the bike different mm -hmm. movement and and identifying those zones for each one of your workouts so it doesn't always translate exactly to the the exercise interesting how do you how do you do that for like the bike and then the swim i guess because usually in my mind it's just like you just run i'm just used to like running at a, a heart rate yeah the big thing for the bike um, and i just got my bike and picked it up and, and been riding a couple miles um, it's figuring out again that cadence which mm -hmm. i think is more important on a bike than maybe on a run you know, the, they say that you want to be up around like 85 to 90 RPMs and you can use your heart rate to determine like what kind of gear you have to shift down or up mm. into to maintain mm -hmm. that. Um, so as you get more tired, maybe you drop a gear to maintain um, that cadence on your legs, maintain that that zone uh, for your heart rate um, rather than like forcing yourself to, to pedal at a more challenging gear than is necessary. And then same with swimming. I've got uh, two heart rate monitors, one on the wrist and then mm -hmm. one that I wear on my chest that does a decent job of giving me that data. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of different threshold tests too, um, that I'll, I'll probably be checking out. And actually if, if they open up some of the hospitals, I'll probably go try to get like a lactate test done. I think, I think it might only be like two to 300 bucks. Um, and, and maybe this, the, you know, like NYU can just do the study for free for some kid that's going through the, the course and wants to do that. Yeah, I got my, that's interesting you mentioned that, because I got my VO2 max texted a couple of years ago at my uh, parent university. So I feel like with Fordham, if you, like, reach out to, like, to, I, I imagine Fordham, like, university has, like, a kinesiology or, like, bioscience department, I'm assuming. Sure. So usually they have, like, a, a setup to test that if they're doing, like, research there. But I don't know if Fordham's super into, like, the sciences I don't know, and that would be a more of a trek to go all the way uptown because uh, oh, you know Fordham's main campus is in the Bronx mm -hmm. um, down here in Manhattan. NYU's uh, close, Columbia's close. Uh, speaking of Columbia, when I went running yesterday in Central Park, uh, I'm standing waiting to cross around like 96th Street in, and like I noticed this like small figure just come up on my right hand side, and I look over and like she looks like a runner. I'm like, oh man, I, I don't want to have like a race right now with somebody. Mm -hmm. Like even, you know, just subconsciously, you know, you're going to like alter your pace. Yeah. And I got a glimpse and she was wearing a Columbia cross country shirt. And I was like, I'm not fucking with that. Yeah. There is zero. And she took off like a rabbit. Like I, I maintained some pace, but you know, again, I'm just training for, for heart rate. I'm not trying to like prove mm -hmm. something that I'm going to hold a seven minute pace for eight miles, but damn dude, like flew just gone. And like five years ago, I wouldn't have let that happen. I would have been too arrogant and too proud to get beat by anybody but now i'm like now you, you're good go ahead yeah so like uh around here when i get into like random foot races but they're not with like athletes it's like random like moms and dads that are running and right. i'm just trying to 
just get past them so I can get past them. <laughs> yeah, really it, it's, it's, it like takes away almost from the training because you're competing against someone else. And that's like mm-hmm. not the point you're supposed to go out with a set goal for that day. And if you get distracted by others, I think it, it translates to, to what we've talked about with Ranger school, SFAS, like you go there, do the best that you know, you can focus on being like that good dude, other people or rasp, like, you're going to have distractions with other people. If you get caught up with them, then you're not really focusing on the important things that will make you successful there. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, fitness, it's, like, really. it's like stay in your lane or run your race or whatever people have that saying. Right. It's just like stay focused on things that you can control versus things that you can't control. Yeah. I think AA has that uh, expression too. But stay in your uh, lane? Not stay in your lane. Like don't, you know, focus on the things that you can control. Don't. Oh, Focus yeah. On. What is it? The serenity prayer is like, Lord, give me the strength to recognize the things I can change and the wisdom to recognize the things that I can't. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dude, I got to talk about moving across country. Okay, sure. Like, my God. Like, I know we have 50 states. I love America. But there are just some states that if I never set foot in again, I will be a very happy person. Mm-hmm. Uh, driving through Kansas, incredibly boring. Uh, Illinois, Indiana, boring. Western Ohio, boring. And I think the crux of that is it's just flat. It's flat. It's nothing but... And I was on I-70, so forgive me if you live somewhere pretty in those states. Uh, but it's just gas stations and McDonald's Mm -hmm. and like wind turbines. And it's a thousand miles of that coming from Colorado. You go from picturesque Rocky mountains to just middle of nowhere. Like I couldn't tell you the difference between Kansas and Western Ohio. Like they look the exact same minus maybe like you go to having a flying J instead of like a Exxon mobile gas station. (laughs) But, like, that's the difference. And then it's it, McDonald's everywhere, like, the most unhealthy eating you could possibly imagine driving. And then, like, as soon as you get to areas that have actual, like, rolling Food. hills, the yeah. Appalachian Mountains, Blue Mountains, like, then it's pretty. I'm, I'm fine with that. But, dude, I wanted to eat my steering wheel, like, to get through those states. Yeah, I was, like, west of the Mississippi and, like, east of the Rockies, the Midwest states are just, like, barren. Yeah, because like I've made that drive a couple times now, and getting ready to make the drive like a third time. I'm not looking forward to the drive. That's like fuck. That's a brutal road trip. Like the Midwest road trip is brutal. So boring. And you know what the thing is? Like previously, every single time I've done this trip, and I think this is the fourth time I've crossed like the the continent. I've always done it as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. And I think that has a lot of negative side effects. It like throws off your diet. It throws off your sleep. You're rushing through it. Uh, generally, I feel like even afterwards you're exhausted. Mm-hmm. Uh, the trip I took out here, I was doing like, I think the longest drive we had was like 11 hours one day, but it was about eight and a half every other day. If I had one or two more days, I think I would have taken five total days, gone a different route, maybe seen some different parts of the country, Mm. stopped in like some pretty scenic spots, driven maybe six or seven hours a day to enjoy like getting in. But yeah, driving through that, I wouldn't know what to recommend. For all the people that are PCSing out there, if the army gives you like six days to move, like I'd recommend taking the six days because Mm. I've, I've always tried to get there as fast as possible and every single time I do that, I regret the decision afterwards. So, but that's yeah. only if your route doesn't take you through middle America. Yeah. Cause I've done, I've done both strategies. Like I've done one where I've done like as fast as possible, which is miserable. And then another drive, which was like a little more scenic taking like stops along the way and like doing stuff. It's definitely more enjoyable doing stuff, but at the same time it's just like, you know, the time and just getting it over with because like, I think from Jersey to Washington, it's like seven days. I think they give you seven days to do that. But I don't know. I still don't really know what, what our plan is going to be because I still haven't gotten orders yet. So I went on orders and then seeing if we can get, even get movers to do it, to like help us move. Because I would much rather movers do everything for us and then we do like a partial ditty and then just like tow like a tow Christina's car 
on my truck and then just do that way and that'd be way more enjoyable than having like a u-haul towing a car and having her drive the truck which i think is what you guys did right yeah uh Alyssa drove her car i drove a 15 foot box truck i had like this tiny little speaker hooked up uh Mm -hmm. inside my truck in order to hear my classes that i was still enrolled in um and then blasting like decent podcasts and good music but yeah i don't know we 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 had a guy scheduled to help moving in and we were fortunate enough uh when we got in they were like oh you can use the freight elevator longer um than than we allow for the evening and so we were able to get everything on saturday night instead of sunday but all night saturday all day sunday we were unpacking like i was physically beat down Mm. like it was an easy task but it's just pain like yeah. just two people it yeah if anything you should have get some guys on task rabbit and help you move in when you get out to seattle that's a good idea yeah it's like but i'll, I'll have to see because i mean if the mover if we can get movers that'd be obviously the most ideal situation but if we can't get movers then we have to get a little more creative but i don't know we'll see we don't, i actually don't have that much stuff too because i just have like the one like my apartment with one bedroom so we actually don't have that much stuff so we might be able to make. I don't know. I just have to figure it out once once you get orders. What do you think the worst PCS move in the army is? Well, I don't know. like just driving or just like in what regards? Yeah, like straight PCS. Like for infantry officers out there, you, you're coming from Fort Benning. Um, I'd say any PCS after Fort Benning without a Ranger tab would suck. <laughs> but assuming you're successful at that school um i would think like going to el paso texas would be an awful pcs uh going to fort Irwin, california awful pcs um do you just only imagine or do you just like like, duty assignments yeah like well i mean like some of the duty assignments like below like going to polk but i wouldn't say the pcs from benning to polk Oh, I see. is is awful that's like a pretty quick drive or relatively quick drive and you're going through like you know the southeast united states so it's kind of swampy it's mm-hmm. kind of cool davy crockett-esque but like driving just flat across the country like through oklahoma like central texas you know wherever Irwin is i've never been to uh the national training center like that would be a, an excruciatingly boring drive yeah i think the uh because i went from Lewis to Benning, that was a fucking miserable PCS. Did I ever tell you the story of my, my PCS from Lewis to Benning? No. Oh, God. So it was just me. I did it by myself with my truck towing like a U Haul trailer. And then uh, I pretty much tried doing it as fast as possible. So there's one day where I drove for like, I only got like four hours of sleep one night. And then, like, the next day, I had, like, a, I went to Costco and bought, a, I had, like, a case of Monsters before I started driving. So, I think the next day, after, like, sleeping, like, four hours one night, I drank, like, <laughs> six Monsters during the day. And I literally had to stop because I thought I was having a heart attack. I was having, like, palpitations at, like, Jesus four o'clock. Buddy. So, I had to, like, stop in, the middle of, stop in the middle of the day driving and, like, to try and take a nap on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota. Rough drive. Would not recommend drinking, like, five Monsters in a day. No, but you know what? Uh, I feel like all of my soldiers uh, in ACO 18 Cab did that on almost every single mission in Afghanistan. Like, and it blows me away that they could digest that. And like, I didn't have to call medevacs because they were having the exact same chest problems that you just brought up. Yeah, it was wild, and that was a that's a mistake I will not make again. <laughs> no, I. I, I'm not a huge fan of uh, energy drinks or staying awake. Like, I'll just do, like, some nice... I, and you got me on it. I, I like just drinking plain black coffee mm-hmm. now. Um, but I found before I could take pre-workout or coffee, at, like, 6 o'clock at night. And I wouldn't have a problem going to sleep. Now, if I have coffee at, like, 4 in the afternoon, I'm not getting to sleep until, like, 11 at night. Mm-hmm. I'll be, like, wide awake. But I'm, like, I've had this stuff in the morning and still been tired as fuck. And it made, like, no difference. But in the afternoon, somehow, I'm, like, I'm just full of energy until, like, I can literally not even force myself to sleep. Yeah, it's. I think that's kind of interesting, too, because I, I had the same, like, thing, too. Because, like, when I was younger, like, taking, I could drink pre-workout, like, four or five, like, a pre-workout at three or four. Yeah. And be fine and work out and sleep fine. 
But like now I've also no- like last couple of years I've also noticed the same thing where like if I drink caffeine like past like two or three PM then like I don't get the a really good night's sleep. No. And like we've got we've got coffee on the pot. I I've got caribou vanilla hazelnut, which is just delicious. It's a it's a dark roast, but it's it's delicious coffee. Like I, I'd recommend that to anybody right now. That's the flavor of the week. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the flavored coffees. Oh my god, you're so you're oh, so I'm a little elitist. Style. Little I'm coffee elitist. elitist. Okay, so back to the PCS thing, though. I think uh, easy PCSs are, like, if you're going from, say, Benning to Hawaii, like, you just got to worry about getting yeah, your yeah. car shipped. Mm-hmm. But every single, like, officer that gets out to Hawaii anyway gets, like, the Jeep Rubicon with, like, the top down so mm-hmm. they can do, go do the the Oahu thing. Um, much, I feel like sh- any Oconus PCS is, like, pretty straightforward because everything is done for you by the military. Like, you, have, you don't have any, like, options. It's all done for you already. Yeah. You just have to get on, like pack all your stuff up move it and then because you have to have movers you can't do it yourself no i was looking at going to uh richardson uh and that was going to be my duty station after i left the career course but um doing like the dual military thing switched out to colorado but when i was thinking about that first move out there it was like oh my god like that was something like 34 hours i think of of driving and then there was an option to like ship your car and i think they gave you like 14 days to move yeah but like yeah i think the only real challenging thing is if you're trying to find a place to live uh when you get there and when you're a brand new lieutenant it's like really challenging because you want to live somewhere that's cool but like not still on post but i've always loved living on post i've lived on post and two or three duty stations now and then growing up as a kid i love living on post like i I would take that every single time but also like during like bolick and stuff or a career course i don't think that really counts as like living on post yeah i mean i lived on post at carson i lived in apache village no i lived in one of the the like junior officer housing senior enlisted housing areas um next to the school there um minus balfour Beatty being quite possibly the worst landlords I've ever 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 come across like mm-hmm. even in like taking property law like the stuff that they were trying to force people to do leaving their homes uh, moving into their homes is like borderline unethical mm-hmm. taking advantage of people not understanding what the property rights were um, like basic wear and tear holding your security deposit for making it seem like that is a a defect which you caused which is just like not the right answer i mean it was and then balfour Beatty comes out at carson and has huge issues because there was so much mold in the lower enlisted housing which is just like awful that we're letting a private organization on getting these huge contracts and Mm -hmm. then they're treating our soldiers like absolute shit and taking advantage of their bah like that that pissed me off and that put a really sour taste in my mouth because it's like this is like that nationally across every single installation like Balfour Beatty should not have been given a second chance to continue being the the private uh landlords for the military like Mm -hmm. they should have had their contract immediately cut like get the fuck off of our post yeah because I think they're just now starting to like fix that I remember seeing like reading the articles in the army times talking about like all the on-post housing is just ass, which, in my experience, all of the on-post housing has always been ass. <laughs> Every post I've yeah, gone to, I, the on-post housing has been terrible. My favorite on-post housing I've ever lived in was in Norton Village at Benning. But that was like, like a shithole. It was a perfect shithole, man. Like, yeah, I know. If, if, if you're going there for a career course, if you're going there for bullock... Dude, if I had been stationed at 375 instead of 175, other than being way angrier... Like, I would have lived on post. No, you, you were wouldn't just, have. Oh, my God. You are no, so you close have. to everything. Yeah, absolutely. You're, I, I wouldn't have to, like, you know, in Alabama, being afraid of the swamp monster coming in and breaking into my house and sleeping with, like, a loaded, you know, pistol next to my bed. Or downtown Columbus sleeping with, you know, a shotgun above the bed because of some random townie. Like, you're on post, man. It is so safe and secure. Like... No way. The only thing I dislike about on post is you can't, like, you know, pit bulls are not allowed, and I have a pit. So, yeah, I, I love living on Benning. Like, that, 
if I could live, if you really said like, hey, would you mind living on Benning? I'd be like, no, absolutely not. Just, I want to live next to the, the airborne shop at, you know, close enough to a small oh, theater. God. Close, dude, I love those homes. It, like old 1950s wood, like you're really close to the gym. I found it really motivating to wake up and see as, as much of like a joke you could consider airborne school being like a three week course that could be taught in three days. Like I liked waking up and every single week seeing a new class going through Tower Week and running, you know, because those guys out there were the future Rangers, uh, you know, dudes going to the 82nd, 173rd, 509th, you know, just like General Airborne and then some dickhead cadets that will never jump after their fifth jump. Like, but it, you know, it was very fun. And then knowing that it's the home of the infantry, like we're going to get into it a little bit about like, you know, successful tips at, at Bullock, but like, I love Benning. I think Benning is like a, a world-class installation. You're giving me that look. That's, yeah, I'm literally at a loss for words right now. No, dude, I I did not like. Uh, it's not not Sand Hill, Kelly Hill. Is that where Three ID was? Uh, yeah, Kelly Hill. Yeah, so like I didn't like the sledgehammer's footprint, but it was so far away from main post or what I'd considered main post. Um, you know, uh, Sand Hill was just a couple roads down but like the training for I mean for a like a an infantryman that's like your dream assignment I think because it's got ranges that are catered towards your your goal of being like an expert with your weapon system it's got incredible fitness facilities to stay in shape you still got like the oh, opportunity it oh my god yes, it does. Not have good gyms. A, Audie Murphy's a fantastic gym that is that's one gym. They're That's unlike, the only gym. Unlike where? Let me, let me think. Where has good po- like good gyms? Carson has fantastic like, gyms. Like Lewis has. Carson like, has. I said Lewis has really good gyms. Oh, you know who has a really good gym? Uh, the uh, who are the loggies? Where log log triple C is? Oh, Fort Lee. Have yeah. You, have you been to that gym? No, you sent me a picture oh, though. Oh man. Like, Look fun. Like, why do they have that gym? I don't How know. Did you earn Fort this? Jackson has six gyms too. Like, Fort Jackson is really nice. All the like the bait, like the, uh, I don't know. It must be like the training po- like Tradoc must have more money because I think trade. I think the Tradoc money, or I, it must be Tradoc money because I, I every Tradoc base I've been to has had really nice gyms. Like Jackson has really nice gyms. Um, Fort Lee has really nice gyms. Benning kind of does, but like I know they're they renovated the one gym. Um, like the Sand Hill over, one? Yeah, over by uh, where the Armor Bullock is. Now. Yeah. They, they tried to make it like a Fu- like CrossFit a functional, functional fitness. fitness. yeah. In fact, that's on the corner of, uh, is, if, is if you're going to uh, 4th RTB too. If I yes. remember right. It's, yes. it's yeah, off yeah, the exit, yeah. 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 Now, I, I thought Benning had, the, what I liked about Benning, and what I'll say for the gyms there, is like while it might have only had like one functional fitness gym, it was never crowded. You only saw, you know, a select few infantry lieutenants that were there going through Triple C or Bullock. You only saw essentially 375 Rangers there. And then that was it because uh, Smith Gym was close enough that, you know, people could just walk the half a mile down the track. And that's where all the, like, meathead, never train legs, like 16-minute, two-mile, like, you know, very uh, creatine-heavy um, just, and I wouldn't say meatheads because they weren't in shape enough to be meatheads, right. but just like, like those types of dudes. I just did a, if you're not watching the YouTube, I just acted like I blew my muscles up. Yeah. I would say bending. Of, excuse me. I'm a little tired. Um, of all the bases that I've been to, I think bending is probably, I would consider bending like average. I would put bending like right in the middle of all the bases I've been to. Okay. In terms of like, because uh, I approach it based not just based I, I approach it based on like based on like the, uh like the post what the post offers in terms of like amenities like gyms the commissary okay. PX, um like I guess eating but like all the, like food on bo- on posts can be shitty either way it's all the same like Burger King what what have you, uh. And then, like, kind of the surrounding area, too, is I put that in my, my base grades or my post grades. And I would okay. put, like, bending, like, pretty much, like, 
I think median, like right in the middle of all the bases. I was like, not it's okay. not the best, but it's got like decent stuff. Doesn't have the best area, but it has like okay. Columbus is okay. Like Atlanta's nice, but it's far. Like everything is about like just average. It's like not bad, but it's not great. You know. Okay, I I get that. I would say so. The like post that I spent some time at um, Benning, uh, Hunter. Uh, I can't remember what uh, Fort Stewart, um, Carson, uh, Leonard Wood. Uh, I think those are the only like posts that I've really spent a significant amount of time on. Um, didn't like Leonard Wood at all. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a couple gyms, but every single time I've been there, it's not like functional fitness. They're all just like the yeah standard head, lifting yeah. standard lifting. Um, 3ID, the Johnson Fitness Center over what used to be 2IBCT, which I think now is like 2ABCT. Johnson Fitness Center had a fantastic functional fitness uh, set up with a ninth of a mile indoor track um, above it, which was pretty good. Uh, had some great like racquetball courts, um, I think a 50 meter lap pool. So that was a pretty good gym, but Stewart in general, it's just tanker mech land um so you know i I don't think the culture is there for fitness uh hunter i think is is like premier just because it's just 175 Mm -hmm. you have the crtf you have downtown savannah so like that's good but i yeah i would honestly say like oh and carson um carson's i think got the same issue that 3id had to be honest because it's all heavy now. You mm. got strikers, you've got Bradleys, you've got tanks, you've got the uh, 10th group, which has its own facility and they stay away from everyone. But for how athletic you could get out in Colorado, and one of the reasons why we started Chronos Fit to see people not taking advantage of the facilities is like disgusting Mm -hmm. and i think general mingus came through there and like made sure that every single one of the companies had some fitness equipment and you go back into the coughs and like you see exactly what kind of fitness these companies are getting after with some company commanders that have never touched a barbell and you would see the weights still in brand new mint condition in their plastic wrap having never been opened you're seeing like concept one rowers that have never been touched that are just collecting cobwebs it's like a huge waste of funds when you give it to units that aren't in shape. Like, and, and it, the H pocket at uh, Carson is fantastic. I mean, you got some like incredible strength trainers. Um, Steve, I know, is one of the guys there really well. He's trained some NFL dudes, and units do not take advantage of their dedicated coach. I mean, like each brigade has like an assigned coach that will program for each company uh, at that level for mm-hmm. platoons. Um, and nobody takes advantage. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I told my three XO, even mentioning to the Brigade Sergeant Major and Commander, like, hey, we've got this asset. We need to have battalions engaged. And it would always be, like, written off, like, oh, we'll tell the battalions about it. Battalions will have to engage. It's like, no, put it out in a tasker. Force, like, company commanders to go meet with these people and go through to the, the new ACFT mm-hmm. and see exactly what they should be doing with the equipment they can resource. And that just, it blew my mind that we would just waste such talent out there. That's like the story of like the army though. It's like a lot, it's like the, it's like an amalgamation of good ideas mixed with very poor execution. Yeah. I'm just going to give you a limited task uh, and a purpose and you should go execute. What is that, that book that everyone has to read at West Point? Letter to Garcia? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I don't know. Like, Everybody reads book? that. It's not, it's not a West Point thing. Everybody reads Letter to Garcia. That's a West Point thing, man. That's I, not a West I've Point never, thing. Mm-mm. I've I, only heard about it talked through, like, the West Point, you know, uh, graduates. They're always like, letter to Garcia this, letter to Garcia that. Like, I never went on a date for four years because I went to West Point, but I read letter to Garcia. That's – I didn't – I actually did not read letter to Garcia until my first commander, who was an ROTC dude, that made me read it as a brand-new second lieutenant. Well, he's a weirdo because he was... But he was a weirdo. Good guy, but just super weird. Art ROTC and went field artillery. No, he was a he was a cav. It was my cav troop. Oh, commander. that's right. You were in a you were a, in a Stetson Stetson formation. Can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah. 
T1 cab, baby. T1 cab. <laughs> this is actually I my favorite a, uh, fucking hoodie. My favorite hoodie I own is this hoodie. I had a really good uh, shirt that we got um, for my co, a co 18 cab. Uh, I really liked, like when I first got there, I was really leaning against the whole esprit de corps because I didn't want to wear a Stetson. Um, I just attributed wearing Stetsons with obese soldiers, which I still do. But like, I liked my company when like we started executing at a high level and my commander like held our feet to the fire. Like we mm. thought at the time it was dickish. I'm talking like if we're doing a layout, we would have to take an embitter and between each line item, you'd have to have the length of the embitter. Between each individual item in serial number order, you had to have the width of an embitter. We had to take 550 cord in our motor pool and stretch it the like 150 meters all the way down in front of each track. And then with Equal. the embitter, then create a grid system to have everything laid out so he could go by and check. But like after a couple times of doing that, like we were incredibly efficient when we tr changed out in Afghanistan with um, the dudes from, I think it was 3rd Brigade 82nd, and it was a deco. They came and we did that layout for them, and it took maybe like six hours total for the whole company to sign over all the property. And within like, I'm not even less than a day, like the 82nd had lost a saw they had lost a uh, gizmo, uh, a mine hound. Apparently, they drove off the fob with it attached to the front of their vehicle. Nice. Uh, the saw was in, uh, like, one of the platoon sergeants or first sergeant's vehicle, locked up for like you know just to have an extra gun in case they needed to like operate the <laughs> turret, but they forgot about putting it in there. And so I had to stay back for a couple days while the rest of the company went back to uh, CAF to like try to help out the you know issues with the equipment i'm like i don't know what to tell you we've already signed all of that away yeah, it's like, like not my I, problem. I have not my problem you you guys jacked it up like go put your shoots on because i'm not doing anything else to help you out but uh yeah like i really appreciated that and subsequently my commander went to one of the headquarters companies and he wanted to do um the first arms room inspection and he was like all right let's see the weapons and he had told his xo like have it all in serial number order, which is a, such a pain in the dick, but you just take like a marker and you just mark every single yeah. item. So you know one through 50. And this dude didn't put it in order. And he just goes, all right, I'll be back at 11 o'clock tonight, fix it. And like, they were blown away that like he could get away with doing that. It's like, yeah, man, like that's a standard. Like this is, you have no idea how stressful it is having all this property on your hand receipt. Like mm -hmm. I was so happy in range regiment was like, no, your platoon sergeant signs. I was like, Yes. <laughs> like, I'm never touching this stuff again. What? I signed for everything. <laughs> Nerd. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. It's, it's funny you bring that up because I didn't really get good at property until I got the regiment. Like in the big army, it was just like it was all like hand waves. Like we have this, sir. All hand waves. But like in regiment, yeah. like my commander was like, "No, I need to see everything, including all BII for everything on cyclical, and then you can do sensitive." But I just got really good at doing, like, understanding how the property system works when I got the regiment. Because, like, in the big army, oh. it's just, like, nobody did, like nobody does it right, I'd say, in the big army. Oh, no. When I went and did the layout for the strikers, like, one, like, the rangers look at that thing and they're like, this just gets us to their range. I have no idea what the mm -hmm. fuck the NBC detector is. And, like, I remember I was like, I need to see it. And the guy's just like, sir, we literally don't know what that is. And like, I'm climbing into a striker going, I don't know what any of this is. God damn it. Like, we need this. And it, it's just funny. Like, some units, like, put a... I think, you know, mech units in particular put a lot of stock in their ability to, you know, inventory equipment and control it because there's so much BII that goes into every single one of the major end items. It's annoying. Like, mm -hmm. but I had no idea. Like, there's a lot of BII associated with just basic light infantry stuff in an arms room that I never even looked at. What, like, every single, you know, set of nods essentially has to have, like, a bag, mm -hmm. the mount, you know, stuff that you just hand wave. Like, yeah, whatever. Like, it's somewhere in one of these totes. But yeah. Uh, but back to our discussion on posts. Yeah. <laughs> Upper tier. So I like to do by quartile. So like top quartile, you're talking about the Oconus posts, like Hawaii, Italy, and Germany are, are your, like your top tier. 
your second tier is your, your like your above average posts or like your Kona's posts. I do like Lewis, Carson are probably like my two like that are like the upper quartile. Average posts would be like I don't know, like Benning. I guess like Bragg. I, I know I guess Bragg might be like I guess Bragg's well we can say Bragg is like average. Campbell is probably like average post. And like low tier, you're talking about like Fort Polk, El Paso. Oof. It's hood. Hood, yeah. Hood, hood, hood. Yeah, I, uh, I, f- I didn't even, I forgot to mention hood in that list. Yeah, hood is by far the worst post. I've, uh, I don't know. It's a toss up between that and Leonard Wood. <laughs> what do you think is the nicest? What do you think is the nicest post you've ever been to? Um, I don't, I don't know. Like, so the Ranger Regiment, the complexes that each battalion has is phenomenal. Like they're gorgeous. Post, the, post, post. I, I know, I know post. I, dude, I couldn't, man, this is hard. How do we gauge like the nicest of a post? Like it's the the scenery. Whatever you want. By gym. However, however you grade your post. What is your number one and your last post? Okay, I would never want to get stationed at Fort Hood ever again. That's my least favorite post. Okay. From a scenery standpoint, from a gym standpoint, from a general order and discipline and fitness, um, then it would go to probably Stewart. Same thing, kind of just swampy. Um, I think some of their priorities there, like, and, and I was an aide, so the like, I I saw how hard the generals were working. These infantry one. officers. Number one, uh, damn it! I would yeah, probably say Benning. That is insane. I know, dude. I there's something about it. I am like, I'm weirdly into Benning, and I'll, again, I'll tell you why. For what I got out of it when I was there with the fitness, the proximity to like just like the home of the infantry. Um, I I generally love the landscape uh, and the geography of Fort Benning. Like it's got the rolling hills. It's got the red clay. It's got that like southeastern kind of swampiness thing going on. Um, You're still kind of close to to mountains if you wanted to get into the Appalachians. I liked Carson, but again, Carson was on like the south side of the front range um, for the Rockies. And so it wasn't like you were training in mountains. I thought when I was going to Carson, I was going to be like a mountain warrior. Like we were going to be doing some sort of like, you know, high angle marksmanship. We were going to be doing, uh, you know, repelling. And then I got up there and essentially Carson sits in the plains. Like mm-hmm. it is very flat. You've got some you've got the same topography at Carson that you do at hood. It it seems like it used to be like the bottom of the ocean. So you'll have like, you know, hills that are a couple hundred feet high, but in general, it's, it's very flat minus like the, the SF land now, of course, where they do all of the, uh, like brigade level FTXs if they don't get a pinion Canyon. Um, I loved Carson cause it was beautiful. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I love skiing, um, go out there all the time. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. Benning, Benning was the number one, man. That's terrible. Yeah, my number, my worst one, worst post, the one I hate the most would probably be Fort Irwin, NTC. That is a fucking hellhole. Just, I cannot imagine being stationed there. Oh, okay. I forgot about Polk, if we're going to count yeah. like JRTC, NTC. I'm talk- Come on, man. Number one favorite and worst post. I don't think uh, it's like... Worst, worst post is, is still Hood. Okay. Like, without a doubt, still hood. Uh, I went to Polk a couple times for JRTC and then um, to travel down there and, like, observe JRTC as an aide. And Polk has, like, some decent gyms. Um, you still got, like, this light infantry pride that I like from the guys down there. I think it's, True. is it 410 or 310? Uh, I think it's 310. 310. And, like, they've got, uh, I think it's Louisiana boulevard or something it's just one stretch where you see every single like battalion and company footprint they've got a ton of obstacle courses up along this couple mile stretch of road tons of rope climbs 
the gyms are pretty well um, you know established there so far as like a functional presence uh, I think once you get off of Polk it's just dog shit but like if you were just living on post like the housing looked all right the amenities for the posts were fine I've got buddies that were stationed there that absolutely loved it because of the hunting that you could do off of Polk but no fuck hood hood's still the worst for me hmm, yeah worse is definitely NTC for me I think the best post I've ever been to I don't know. Vicenzo is really nice. I like spent like a week in Vicenzo. Well, not like a week, but like I visited my some friends in Vicenzo when I went to Italy. Vicenzo is really nice. I actually strangely like Korea a lot. Like I love Korea when when I was there for training deployment. Oh, uh, I never. I never been. Korea is cool. Okinawa is fucking dope. We went to Okinawa when we were in Korea. It was probably, we, we went over for like a site survey, potential to do like a training event over in Okinawa. We we're gonna we we're gonna, planning on jumping in Okinawa, and doing that like a been cool. like a mini like a force on force mod uh, in Okinawa. But Okinawa is fucking dope. Uh, Okinawa is sweet. Korea, is, I like Korea a lot. Uh, but I don't know. Number one for me, I think in my mind it's still gonna be Lewis. Yeah, dude, I wish uh, I had gotten up to Lewis. Like, you're lucky that's the second time you're going to be there. Yeah. Uh, speaking of North Korea, first, I we weren't even talking about North Korea, but Korea in general. Kim Jong-un. Probably alive. alive who knows? Or who dead. Knows? I, I'll tell you who definitely knows if he's dead. Carol Baskins. Right. She She definitely knows. Like, if there's a tiger in North Korea, guaranteed that she was there and she fed him. Yeah. I was like, uh, I don't think anybody knows, because I know South Korea doesn't think that he's dead. And South Korea probably has the most, uh, or, like, one of the most, I guess, or more reliable information networks, I guess. Aside from, I guess, yeah. America, like, having, but there's no, sp like, there's no spies. Like, America doesn't have spies in North Korea. But we could get a sister running the country. Can you imagine yeah. that? A female leader of North Korea before a female president in the United States? That'd be hilarious. Some that's bad. <laughs> that's that'd be some pretty embarrassing stuff. Yeah, it'd be hilarious. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think I know anything about her. I do know that she's supposed to be like really brutal. God damn it! I was hoping it would be like a completely different flair from. No, I think the Kims. Yeah, I think she's supposed to be, like, really brutal and, like, not, like, a super, like, uh, totalitarian in that regards. Damn it. Well, maybe, maybe President Trump can negotiate with her. Uh, I like how he's taking credit for not being at war with North Korea. Like, he brought that up at a press conference in, like, the last month where he's like, you know, we're doing great things. We'd be at war right now with North Korea. It's like, no, we wouldn't. Mm. Like... We absolutely would not. There, there's no one in America that was like, we're going to go to war with them. And then it was like, he came in and was like, wait, guys, stop. We can't. It's like, whoa. Like, thank you, President Trump, for saving us from a conflict we weren't going to enter. Like, I, I know John Bolton, you know, is a war hawk and has always been, like, pretty strict on, you know, applying the most forceful measures possible against that country. But there was no way that they were going to walk into a war either. Like Kim Jong Un's not that stupid. He's not mm. about to go to war with a country that will wipe him out in a single day of bombings, just so that he can lose power. Like he's just, he just likes to talk out of his ass. So to think that we avoided war because of the president was like, I mean, just another one of the list of things you can add to the statements he's made in the last month, including light treatment, which. I'll let you get to in a second, but also, you know, sticking a bottle of Clorox down your throat and somehow, like, getting that on the inside of your body. Because, I mean, so I actually looked it up, and there is been a scientific studies into UV blood irradiation. It's actually pretty interesting. It was actually studied a lot in the 40s and 50s. Because at that time, antibiotics were invent weren't invented yet, so they were searching for therapies that could like uh, um, pretty much like stop like reduce infection rates and help you heal from infections. So they had a lot of like data back in the 40s and 50s, and then with antibiotics being invented, they kind of fell to the wayside. So I think there it's interesting some of the data they found because they um, 
with the UV blood radiation, uh, basically they found that, you know, just by irradiating like 5% of your blood volume, you have like systemic effects from that. So like your it has like immune modulating effects so it helps your immune system overall. It helps your like blood cells, like, I don't know, like live longer or more resilient. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so that How was- How do you think that came about though? Do you, do you think like President Trump was sitting, listening to a brief or heard a brief and then got up there and was like, all right, doctor, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to bring this up as if I'm just like spitballing ideas with my lack of science background. And I just want you to nod your head like, wow, I've, in all of my, you know, 40 years of doing medicine, I've never had that idea, that epiphany. Thank you. Like, that's a great idea, Mr. President. Like, do you think that's how it came up or? I think it was more so like, because I think they had like the one graphic that was like, you know, sunlight kills, like UV kills, and like you have disinfectants too. So I think it was saying like, I wonder if there's a way that we can take this power or this capability and put it inside our bodies, you know? But uh, but it's kind of interesting too, because I'm kind of mixed on that too, because at the same time, like scientists aren't necessarily the best at connecting dots because scientists get, you know, they get like information silos that exist everywhere in science. Um, so like, researchers are super specialized in their one field and only study that one thing so then they don't realize what else is going on in the field so they aren't able to make those connections uh between like multiple fields so like for example like you'd be yeah. like bloody radiation like most infectious disease doctors have never heard of it because it wasn't studied and there's uh, there's not much in the literature nowadays but, but it was studied back in the day so like it it could be that you know by having the president just like spitball ideas it can help like raise you know awareness or bring up thoughts that could be investigated further do i think it yeah, helps he, it doesn't did he bring that up on his own like did he i don't see know that and bring it up or was that one of those he was trying to stage like a like a, i've come up with the the cure because like you know i want to like again it's all about the image uh molding that he's trying to do or do you think it was a sincere like i'm just up here just talking I think it's more like one of those, like, I'm just up here rambling and just random thought popped in my head, so I'm going to say it. Kind of ideas. Because yeah. I don't think he... Because I, I don't know... I don't know what was worse, man. Like, to then the next day be like, no, I was just being sarcastic. I was trolling. It's like, you're being... You're going to troll yeah. during the time of a pandemic. Like, I'd rather you just get up there and be like, I made a mistake than just not have the integrity to be, like, owning it. Yeah, but it's like classic, like, stay in your lane type things. Like, leave the science to the scientists and, like, just work on being a leader and being able to manage everything versus trying to, like, micromanage the scientists and telling them how to do science, you know? Yeah, what's what's the, the like, issue that everyone had with hydrochloroquine? Like, for a month, just pushing that hard because Fox News was just playing it over mm -hmm. and over again. And then, like, subsequently, they've done the case studies and, like, this is not good. Yeah. Like there's a higher rate of strokes. Um, it only works in certain, you know, cases like it's not studied. And, but like I think hydrochloroquine was the the market for it went up 40, 40 times, 40 fold, uh, you know, in the month that they were pushing it on, you know, essentially just one network. Like that's nuts. Like That's yeah. taken away from the science. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, it's just like the. I think it's just I think the pandemic is highlighting a lot of like the societal and kind of the I guess uh system systematic like flaws in America in terms of like education and you know scientific understanding and just mass media and like mass information because people you know aren't you know I didn't understand like how science worked until like I started you know in med school and started learning about science and how that shit works it's like a very complicated process that like unless you do science you don't really understand some of the you know finer details of of doing research and doing science and discovering stuff like that so like while you know while hydroxy like chloroquine might be beneficial you have to prove that's beneficial and just by saying anecdotally that it might help doesn't prove that it does help or does have any benefit and like what you highlight what anecdotally means cuz like they use it all the time. I didn't know what it meant until I had to look it up because it was just it's not a it's not a word that I use day to day. Like and it, so, an anecdote is like a personal story or personal experience. So like if you if you, if there's so anecdotally is like 
an a, like a low end, so like a very low number of people have like reported that. So that's like anecdotally, uh, and anecdotal, anecdotal evidence, which is like probably like that is like the lowest quality of evidence that you can have when it comes to science. There we go. See, I looked it up because I kept hearing it, and I was like, "Huh." I hear anecdote, and I'm like, I think analogy because I'm an idiot. And then I had to look it up what it meant because I kept using it on the news. So thank you, Bobby. Thank you for insulting my intelligence. See, that's something I didn't know, people. Like, that's not I a science word. Anecdotally isn't a science word, though. Whatever, nerd. When did you hear it before, <laughs> when, before you went to med school? not a science word. <laughs> I was like a f- when, when, when did you use the word anecdotally prior to going to med school? Probably the SATs. It's like an SAT okay. word. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly what I thought. You fucking nerd. Uh, but yeah, it's just, I, and it's like, everybody thinks they know what they're talking about because, um, have you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? I think we've talked about this before, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. The more you know, the less you know. Yeah. So like, uh, pretty much like there was like the line of like how much you do know versus how much you really know. And like when you just start off learning something, you think you know a lot about something because you don't know what you don't know yet. And then as you learn more, you finally realize what you don't know. So then as you learn more, you, your actual knowledge like goes down because you realize there's more to learn and it finally comes back That's up. That's why I got bad grades. It all makes sense now. Yeah. So like a lot of people that because we have so wide access to like, you know, information and online with like technology and stuff. So people have a general, like a, you know, basic level understanding of most sciences. Probably I would say most people, most people have like a basic understanding of sciences, but they don't have like a firm understanding of it or a firm grasp of it. So they think they actually know more than their actual knowledge base gives them. And then because they think they know more, they become more vocal. They, they think they know everything. And this in turn causes all the confusion that you see in the media, like everyone having, like, like everybody knows somebody that knows something about COVID that, you know, that isn't like, that's like new or something, you know? And something like the conspiracy yeah. theories, like you know, the 5G is just like, the, you know, doesn't make sense. No, that's, uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, I don't think that's been established. Did I Shit. use that in the sentence correct, doctor? Uh, I don't think that that was a correct. I don't think I it. did. Yeah, no, I don't think so. You you yeah. would say like anecdotally, I haven't experienced any COVID and five G relate like connections. You could say that way. Well, I can't say that yet because uh, New York City is five G, and I live here again. So I would be a bad test subject. I can't be like Las Vegas and be the petri dish uh, for America. Vegas is the floor is petri dish for America. No, did you see the mayor of Las Vegas on Anderson Cooper? Uh-huh. Like, she wanted to open up Las Vegas without coming up with an effective plan to, like, control that opening and said it was up to the businesses and that if a business developed, like, increasing cases of coronavirus, then that was uh, competition at its finest, um, creating... <laughs> creating a system by which you know businesses flourish or don't so it's on them for you know doing that i mean which is like a super 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 like republican talking a point when we talk about federalism and like how much government control Mm -hmm. gets exerted over private entities but it was like she wanted to open up uh las vegas as a test study for the country to see if you could do like herd immunity um, like New Zealand and, and Sweden, uh, I think we're trying to do. Yeah. But it was just like the things that she was saying, like, you know, if people died there or something, like alluding to that not being like her concern. And, you know, she's no longer going down to the floors of the casinos because she's got a family to consider. It's like, I think we're just now speaking, you know, from a very authoritative place and not, not rationalizing some of the decisions. I, like Governor Cuomo here in this in, in New York um, has been trying to articulate it's we, not me, you know, or, you know, people, so, it's not like the worst thing that can happen is you die and like, it literally can't get worse than that. But like, I, I slightly disagree from that statement, but there's a fine balance somewhere. So I have a good question. I've, th- this is actually a good point or a good question. A good point for me to ask this question. How do you feel about the whole, like, um, you know, personal liberties versus like public welfare and public good? Because I think I find, like, I 
personally find a like personally i veer towards the side of public good but i can very easily see the arguments of those who are protesting the government regulations about the covid and all that stuff and i can very easily see their 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 like a uh, point of view and I can really easily empathize with that because oh 100 percent, i can completely empathize when i think the bulk of working americans in this country live paycheck to paycheck mm-hmm. Um, which I think is uh, just a result of, like, you know, outrageous housing markets at the moment uh, in general. But, like, even that aside, I, I don't know. I don't know where I fall completely. I agree that the, the government, and it's really a Tenth Amendment issue with uh, the quote-unquote police powers and maintaining uh, the health, safety, and welfare of uh, the citizens of, of each state. Um, it's kind of like the whole idea of sovereignty. Um, but there are a lot of things like sitting through constitutional law that I find myself like disagreeing with our approach. For instance, like hate speech mm-hmm. is essentially a protected speech, so long as there aren't you know there are certain it's exceptions like inciting, to hate speech. Yeah. Um, but like I think in general, like hate speech should not be allowed. Mm-hmm. I I think there's no place for it because it. You know, and there's a couple um, John Stuart Mills and Michael John talk about like this idea of having a a town hall like event where you have a forum for ideas to be tossed about people become educated and then so the less educated ideas and the ignorant ideas that might be hostile to the majority of the country are eventually kind of stamped out and that idea you know stemming from the idea that we can squash this idea of communism of you know the nazi discussions but for me like i don't have the patience for that like Mm -hmm. when you go to war with somebody like Nazi Germany and the atrocities that they committed. If you support a Nazi government, um, some sort of like a fascist socialist regime like that, or you espouse like virtues that you thought were great that the Nazis had, you should be locked up. Like I don't have any tolerance for that Mm -hmm. whatsoever. But the fact that we as a country tolerate that when so many tens of thousands of Americans died over there, I, that's, that's like where I, I stand at odds with, the government in this aperture of, of liberties um, that we we have protected by you know um, the Bill of Rights and, and the other amendments, but so far as COVID is concerned, I really do think it's up to the states. Mm-hmm. You look at a state like California and New York, and I think why it impacts the rest of the country so much is because such a large extent of our GDP is based on the industries that are located within those states. Um, you look at the revenue that New York and California generate and how that gets dispersed to other states, um, specifically through, uh, you know, the state-sponsored employment. You know, you are hurting a lot of, you know, states in the middle of the country, states in the south that really only have kind of like an agricultural-based mm-hmm. GDP. So I think it's difficult because a lot of states are probably pissed off at places like New York and California for not opening because it directly impacts the money that the government would disperse to them, Mm -hmm. you know, say in like a state like Kentucky, which was a huge uh, point of contention between Senator Mitch McConnell and Governor Cuomo. Like they were just having a tit for tat for this blue bailout idea. Um, I think the government can open up more than it has. Uh, I don't think, you know, as much as I want to see gyms get opened, I think gyms are probably one of the last places that should be opened. You know, you, you look at, like, general fitness improvement uh, helps with immunity, but you're going to have people that go overboard in the gym, and then when you train to such extents, usually you have a pretty, um, I think, low uh, immunity level. Like, you know, you can, you can shock your system to, uh, to certain degrees. Um, but I think, like, restaurants, you could do something to help them out. Um, if you're in like manufacturing, I think you should still be able to do that. Like, you know, Nike can still produce stuff. Amazon can still produce stuff. So I think people were overly cautious in some of the industries that we, yeah. we put a halt on. Yeah, I was just kind of curious to see your perspective on kind of that dynamic between like personal liberties versus the greater public good. Because, uh, you know, it's like this is un- very or pretty much unprecedented times in terms of the pandemic. Like the last time this major pandemic occurred was like 1918 it was like a century ago 
which like yeah. they don't we didn't it's like this, it's not it's like apples to oranges it's not the same thing because technology wasn't there like social media information wasn't there either so i i don't know i find like i just i don't know what the right answer is because yeah on the one hand like you want to protect everybody but at the same time though like everybody you want you don't want to treat everyone like children too no right? i don't like the false equivalencies that people use to compare like one you know, you, you could use the word pandemic for a lot of things, gun violence, um, swimming pool drownings. I think Dr. Phil brought that up like an idiot. Um, you know, other flus that people have, you know, like I think you were saying something like we lose 60,000 people a year to the common flu uh, earlier. And, you know, now we're topping like 55,000 right now for Corona, even though it the mortality rate is higher. Um, I do like completely see, though, the argument that people were making where, Hey, like, is it worth completely ruining our economy for the foreseeable future and yeah. long-term savings for a, maybe a percentage of the population that is already, a, you know, at a higher likelihood of succumbing to, you know, health, I mean, excuse me, um, like lung diseases or, you know, heart-related diseases and are going to die anyway within the next two to three years. Like, how do you balance that? Because yeah. somebody somewhere is evaluating the cost of a life and saying, okay, like, if this is impacting really people from 60 to 80, you know, try on. I don't think I was, like, not so much from, like, a health perspective. I think more from, like, a personal, like, rights perspective. Like, for example, like, if, for example, like, California has been, I've seen this a lot in the news in California where they have, like, police, like, arresting people for surfing or for being on the beach. But they're just by themselves on the beach, too. So it's, like, they're technically obeying by social distancing norms they're not gonna you know they're not at risk of exposing themselves to others to covid or to coronavirus but then you have the government like imposing their power on this individual that's just practicing their civil liberty or the the right to you know enjoy public land well yeah so that that kind of goes back to this idea like you know onesies and twosies that are out there by themselves seemingly not impacting a larger population and uh, for instance, back in the 19, I want to say 1930s, 1940s, where we switched to a more liberalized view of, of rights um, and for private entities, um, there was like a farmer that was, I think, in Kansas, and he decided to grow like wheat, and he only wanted to use it for his personal use. He wasn't going to put it into the mm-hmm. uh, economy. Um, you know, even you could argue, is this an interstate or intrastate? And the government used the Commerce Clause to say, no, we were restricting growth on these crops specifically because if we have too much uh, uh, supply, it's going to drive down the price, you know, on the supply demand curve. Um, and it doesn't matter if you were going to use this for your own personal benefit. Like, the reason why we can pass these laws is because of the Commerce Clause because we have to be able to regulate, regulate everything. Mm-hmm that contributes to the economy. So along the same kind of rationale, you could say, while onesies and twosies don't seem to add up on the aggregate, if everyone were to contribute and do something like this, you might have a spike um, you know, in the, the amount of COVID confirmed cases. And so like from that perspective, you could argue, yeah, that's right. But from the other one, like this is, this is your right. Like if you wanna go out and contract COVID, that's your decision. Um, right. I don't look at it, though, like, oh, you could possibly give COVID to someone else. Because if, if you were to make it so that everyone had to go out and get physically tested, which is a way you could circumvent this, if you somehow mandated that everyone has to go get tested, just like when you were getting gas in the 70s when we had the shortage, and if you were approved and didn't have COVID, then you can do whatever. Then you, could, then you can go out and do whatever. But that goes back to, like, oh, now the government's tracking people and and now you could look at that as a disability and we are discriminating against disabilities you know um i think the same argument was made uh it would be akin to the star of david during uh the holocaust and identifying people i mean people go to like some extremes sure but to some extreme like that would be yeah a very apt comparison um but i don't know it this is just having such an impact on jobs nationally that I don't think 
the country can really sustain this very much longer in these like phased rollouts where it has to be two weeks of declining numbers in COVID cases right. um, is just not going to be realistic because as government starts opening up in each state, you're just going to have a spike Surf, regardless yeah. because there's going to be more interaction. It, it's yeah. like a, it's this never ending circle. It's just two snakes eating each other from the, you know, the opposite end. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's just like, I don't know obviously what the right answer is, but it's just like, I can see after this, there being like such, like I can just see the anti-government sentiment like rising in America already, you know? And just the, the, cause it's just like, you know, just like the, the, I guess like self perceived notion of like trampling of personal rights and liberties, you know? And it's just like, that's a that's hundred percent. Yeah. But it's just like, but it's just like how American culture is too. Cause in the rest of the world, like if, if you have countries that have known, they have like histories of like, I guess like more socialist or more like socialist like ideals, they, people understand in the culture is that the greater good prevails over the individual liberties. But like America is sure. very unique in that fact that, you know, we have the bill of rights and this where country was founded on the ability or the, you know, the personal rights that we all like hold in this country. Oh, it's not, it's unreal because we we split from. I can't a, connect a, to your Wi-Fi network. You can find setup instructions in the help section of your. Alexa. Shut up, Alexa. <laughs> we split from like a total tyrant. I can't connect to Shut your up, Wi-Fi network. Alexa. No one likes you. Instructions in the help section of your Alexa app. <laughs> anyway, like we split from a tyrant with like the formation of our country being government will never inject itself into our lives, mm-hmm. whether it's like quartering troops, our inability to protect ourselves, uh, due process. And then, you know, like we expanded all of that with like the 14th Amendment mm-hmm. and substantive mm-hmm. due process. So it's kind of like at the heart of Americans to push back right. against the government. And it, it goes back to one of the conversations we had, I want to say three months ago, where we talked about patience being an issue with Americans and wanting to see change versus some other societies. It's like, you know, when China was building the Great Wall, when the Egyptians were Mm -hmm. building the pyramids, that stuff took generations. It didn't happen in the span of five to 10 years, which I think is a little bit of, you know, America's, um, you know, negative attributes because we we don't have i think the resiliency to see three see things in longer into the future you know Mm -hmm. it's a very like short-term satisfaction that we're seeking you know it's like you want that high um and and you you can't be like all right i'm gonna be delay i'm gonna accept where i'm at yeah yeah i don't know i'm just kind of curious to see what would happen to this because i like i struggle that with like because i think politically i'm pretty much a libertarian from everything in regards like i i'm a firm believer in like reducing so i'm like pretty i guess more right-wing more conservative than liberal in terms of i believe that like the government should be to pretty much stay the fuck out of my life until like it matters <laughs> unless like until yeah. you know what i mean and like the, the the less power the government has is probably the better you know but at the same time that like, i can you know just that's just my personal like take on it, it's just that government's probably not a good thing like over government's not a good thing over bureaucracy is not a good thing either so there's gotta be like you know like a, like a some kind of happy medium you know i'd be fine with over government if certain conditions were met um uh, being like term limits uh if we didn't have this idea of like a unitary executive where essentially the the president through executive order Um, as well as like some agency theory could kind of shift and, you know, promulgate like one party's ideas for anywhere from four to eight years. Like if the majority, and it goes back to like an idea that like Mayor Pete Buttigieg was talking about, about having just a pure democracy when voting for president and like getting rid of the electoral college, you know, we do that in every other vote for Senate or for the House. And so if we were to do something like that and like eliminate gerrymandering, or like eliminate like a Senate, for instance, and this mm-hmm. is like super radical stuff. I'm just like spitballing here. Sure. Um, if we were to, a, you know, check the pulse of the country more rapidly on more frequent of uh, an occurrence, then if the lawmakers are like, hey, we have to shut down for significantly longer than just a month or two months, you'd be like, okay, like that's the will of the people. Like 
you have you can't be a counter majoritarian. Mm -hmm. You have to accept some of the things that the other party wants because the majority of Americans want that. Right. Like, oh, interesting. do I, you know, you, you, there has to be some maturity there in understanding the other side, and it just goes back to what we constantly harp on. There seems to be no meeting in the middle. Mm -hmm. There seems to be no understanding the opposite side on any single network. It's just you get one viewpoint and that's the only viewpoint that you understand and because you're not exposed to an actual dialogue discussing topics or being able to empathize with the other side it's very combative it's hostile and so it's almost like you're litigated constantly against this like nameless adversary and as soon as you meet someone that's of the other side you just have this like negative connotation mm -hmm. um, whenever their name comes to mind because why else would you like despise them so much? Yeah. I just think it's like an incredibly immature system, um, you know, that just feeds itself. Yeah, because that's like one of my biggest, and I actually thought about this for a long time too. Because I noticed like on um, like social media, like I've noticed on Facebook that like it's always the people that don't really know what they're talking about are always the loudest and most vocal. And, like, I used to, in the past, get into, like, arguments online and, like, trying to explain, like, how it really is. But then they always, these arguments always, like, devolve into, like, name-calling and labeling versus actually discussing, like, facts and actual, like, you know, like, adult discussion on, on the facts. And I've yeah. just started to, to realize that that's, that's what is, like, feeding into this perception and, like, the sides because less people are willing to, like, discuss and share their thoughts so that in everything it all becomes affirmations instead of you know disagreements online so you get this like never-ending cycle this positive feedback loop of oh i have the right ideas because everybody agrees with me online because only the people that agree with me are, are challenging or agree or like or are voicing their opinions because they nobody wants to pick a fight anymore online yeah so that's, i mean so have, like pockets yeah you know we can real briefly we, we talk about education um and the huge argument right now between like uh whatever, get rid of student loan debt, but the bigger issue being make, you know, public universities free or near free and affordable because if you have a more educated population, like as much as some people look at colleges as being very snooty and snobberish, like you have discussions in each class. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't tell you at, at school how many discussions we've had that have made people like incredibly uncomfortable, like just talking from a conservative standpoint. You know, it, I think there's a stigma that every single university is very liberal, which probably is, is generally true. I mean, most universities that, that I've seen um, or, you know, with alumni that I've talked to have been generally more liberal leaning. But it's not like it's because the university professors are forcing you to write about that on an essay. I think it's just because you're in an environment where because you can have dialogue, you have more empathy. Mm -hmm. And so if maybe you were more conservative when you get there, well, maybe you're leaving just a little less conservative. You can still have those, those formal views, but it's not as... You know, there's not as much animosity, you know, when you then have a discussion with your cousin at Thanksgiving or your aunt and uncle who, you know, did it. So if you could argue like, OK, well, maybe we need more governance, like maybe if we have more government education, things will smooth out and it won't be as combative. And maybe instead of having two parties, we're going to have many parties that will break off because people will be so fed up with the nonsense of the two party system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one idea and one example of how maybe bigger government could impact in the future for, you know, more small government because of discussion. Yeah. Like, I think that's a great point. Like, I, I would love to see the end of the Tea Party system because I think it's just the way that we choose our presidents is trash. And just in general, like the whole like, primary debates and like, like, in what world can you tell me that Biden deserves to be president? Like, I like, like you know, what I mean, none. It's like, I mean, in what world is, is, is this 80 year old, you know, guy that can barely speak and form coherent sentences is going to be the president of the United States, you know? And it's like, that, what, and what kind of failure is that on, like, the American political system for that to happen? You know, we talk about, like, valuing life, and I think if you're in the military, um, you have, like, a real appreciation, especially if you've been deployed for the life that you've been given, but you also understand, and, and you've talked about it extensively, about being fine with your own mortality, 
And so with that understanding, you know if you're getting to live to the age of 60 or 70, having experienced all cultures around the world, like that's a huge privilege. Like that is a really nice right. So from this standpoint, you could argue, once you get to 60 or 70, you should not be involved in politics. Like True. politics should be a younger generation's game because you know that's where maybe the bulk of change uh, should come from instead of being dictated by this invisible hand of the previous generations. So instead of having 80-year-olds you know, tell me how I should be living because they grew up during the time of segregation you know, and use completely inappropriate language, like that does not qualify you to lead me mm -hmm. just because medicine has prolonged the natural life of your peers and we're just now in a state where we don't have term limits and so you can just get away with being in control. Like other than term limits, there should probably be an age restriction on running for office. Like you could easily make that argument. It would never pass. It would never fly right, because you'd be writing off such a huge. You'd be leaving off such a huge population from engaging in the political discourse. It just goes back to like, I don't want someone that has a questionable past, and I think your past should include your family. Joe Biden's kids, like one uh, died of cancer. Hunter Biden is total trash, like total garbage. Uh, you know, I think looking at his, uh, his cocaine use that he got busted for in the Navy, I don't think that was a mistake. I think that was on purpose so he could, you know, have his deployment time, have this little mishap in the Navy, and then eventually run for office like his dad did and run off his coattails. But, like, Trump's kids are garbage. Biden's kids are garbage. Um, or, sorry, Biden's son the one that's alive is complete garbage. Like you should be judged off that too. If you can't run your own family effectively, how the fuck are you going to run a country? Like under no circumstances should be, you be given a leadership position. And I understand like kids will do what kids do. And like, you can't always dictate how your kids turn out. But if you're going to like sit up there and espouse all these values to me and your family members don't even follow them and more than one doesn't follow them, or you personally don't follow them with like your creepy hands or your creepy kisses, like get the fuck out of office. Mm -hmm. I see your track record too. It's just like, especially with Biden, like having such a big in politics for so long, like not having the the most stellar track record in terms of Dude, standpoint. He's worse than John Kerry with the flip flopping. Yeah. Like that was a huge issue for Kerry back in like the early two thousands. It's the exact same thing with Biden. Like that dude has said more inappropriate things like on camera than I think like John Kerry did. And at least John Kerry was a Vietnam War vet. Like what has Biden ever done except again, use really <laughs> poor choices of words, go to law school, represent Delaware, which I know was your home state, but is only really known for having corporate headquarters of almost every single major company in the United States because of its tax policies. Like, you're not offering us very much here, Sleepy Joe. Like, not to coin a term that the president <laughs> uses, but, like, like Joe, dude, like, is this seriously the best that the Democratic Party could scramble up? And like, I know, like, every single one of the candidates was bad, but if you're supposed to be the party that's very, like, forward and liberal thinking, mm -hmm. you can't tell me that there wasn't one qualified woman or one person of color that could be representing the, like, party, quote-unquote, of the future – Instead, you're going to go up and dig up this relic who didn't even, like, have the balls to run after President Obama left office. Like, you're telling me that that should have been the time that you ran. Just like, uh, I think it was George Bush Sr. after he was vice president. Like, you took a couple years off to, like, play backseat quarterback, like, morning after quarterback. And now you're going to come in here, like, forgetting to put your dentures in before you go give a speech and then realizing that you're not running for Senate anymore. You're running for the president of the United States. Like, dude get out of here like i don't want to hear about how you want to put an embargo on cuba because that fidel castro was one bad guy it's like joe this isn't the 60s anymore bro like have you not seen fast and furious i think it was fast and furious 8 like there was a huge scene that was set in cuba like it's a badass oh, yeah. scene don't tell me you don't want to open up that economy like yeah. i'd love to go to cuba i would love to go to cuba fuck yeah uh but yeah i don't know it's like the with pol. I, I'm just. Do you think there's gonna be a day where Americans in general just fed up with politics and just you know do something about uh, it? No, 
Cause no, like, and for all the like the three percenters yeah, out 3%ers. there, like if you've not seen that Vice documentary, go watch it. Um, I almost look sometimes at the three percenters like the guys that could be like borderline National Guard. Like you're just like, like you do this random drill once a weekend. You go shoot your gun um, yeah. at a at like a twenty five meter range. It's the same thing. You just you just want to wear the kit because you want to look cool, but you're not really like you're not gonna fight. Like, you can't tell me that, I don't care if you've got, like, a belt-fed drum, if, you know, you're rocking some sort of, like, a custom, you know, M4 hybrid. It, having seen the capabilities of the United States military, like, if we wanted to crush an insurrection, the insurrection's going to get crushed. There, there's no way that the people will revolt. Yeah. Like, that shit's just not going to fly. You know, I always think this very... I've always thought it interesting that America hasn't had, well, I guess in present in modern times, hasn't had these this like, um, I guess like a uh, habit for protesting, because like if you look at like, because I like to think about like France and look at France, like the French protest like weekly, and then it's like they're like legitimate protests where they like storm like, you know, like shop to the sea or whatever, and protest like for their rights. Like we're in, like what? How many times in recent history in America have you seen like a protest, like a countrywide protest against something? I, I not remember like Black Lives Matter, but you know Black Lives Matter kind of like fizzled out. Like they didn't really. I think that was a good case study in like what not how not to protest because it was just like a people were just protesting for this. In my in my opinion, like protesting for the sake of protesting without actually having like a unified, you know, goals or unified approach into what they're trying to achieve. Well, the problem with that is if you look at the protests like in France, like there were a couple on the policy with oil and, you know, mm -hmm. truck drivers and taxi drivers being pissed uh, in Spain as well. Yeah. And then you had some like more national movements um, after the shooting at the bar to drum. What is it called? Bella, Bella drum, wherever the, there was a shooting. And so there was a flare oh, of yeah, nationalism, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, anti-immigration. But the problem is with the United States. And again, we go back to patience is like black lives matter should have only been about you know protecting the minority communities mm -hmm. like and and now when i say minority communities now all of a sudden people are like okay no like we need to include um you know minority faiths in there too and then people got angry because it was like okay if white people are participating in the black lives matter movement you know a bunch of these like you know keyboard warrior moms out there that came then you had uh, minority communities saying like hey you're taking this from us and then there became splits because when you had like the women's march it was well it wasn't inclusive of all women what about women that are republican too not just a, a very liberal idea and so the problem with u.s protests is and same with occupy wall street is you get this idea going and it's very focused at first and it's great and it's channeling the right messages but then you have like fringe elements and it's the silent majority that gets overruled by the very oh, loud minority, minority that are like, no, like this should really only be focused on like uh, black lives and Muslim lives. And if you're a white woman, if you're cis, and then it's like, oh, well, what about, um, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community? Like that impacts us way different. This Black Lives Matter movement impacts us way differently um, than traditional just heterosexual people. And so like you have all these tangents that split off. You can't get like a coherent message. Mm -hmm. You have so many uh, people that want to be leaders within the movement. And I think a lot of it has to go back to like this social media influencer thing. That's not like a altruistic uh, desire to improve a community because they want to like run on it later. Um, but like they, they can't find one person that just stands up and goes, guys, LGBTQ is a huge issue. We're going to have a separate thing going for that. Um, you know, the, the disparaging language used towards, um, Islam and, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the other minority religions is terrible. We're going to have a focus on that in March in Washington. Women's rights, we're going to do that, but that's going to be inclusive of all women, whether you're Democrat or Republican, because, you know, the pay gap affects all of us. But instead of being able to do that, you try to mush it all together, and then it just sounds like complaining. Loses, yeah. And it loses steam. It loses the attention of the media because the media can no longer even talk about it without offending 
one of the fringe elements that's just going to be automatically triggered. It goes back to the idea of being triggered about everything. Mm-hmm. Like, and again, understanding there's different viewpoints, and you just have to have the maturity sometimes to sit back and go, okay, like the country has made massive improvements in itself from like the Stonewall riots to now with like LGBT rights, for example. We're going to get there with the rest of the groups. Like that's one of the great things about the country. But we just expect everything to happen at once, simultaneously, mm-hmm. overnight, and it's just, it's impractical. Yeah. So, like, I think I think that's like a huge issue with with our United States protests, and you know, we used to protest tea, you know, back, uh, you know, with the King of England. Yeah. Can you imagine trying to protest that same topic now? Like, it would start with tea, and it would end with like environmental protection. <laughs> like, People, yeah, Americans I, now are just scatterbrained. Yeah, I, I guess true. That's very true. I just remember, like, I just picture like back in the '60s and like talking about like Martin Luther King des- desegregation. Like, that was like, you know, like a well-led like protest that you know ha- actually resulted in change. So I just wonder, just like a personal thing, I just wonder like what has really changed since then. Like, we're still, you know, not able to to advocate for certain groups and protest for what for us, you know. No, I mean, it's one of the reasons why, like, I'd like to stay in public interest law because, like, short of going out on the picket lines and, and protesting, again, law, I think, is one of those occupations where if you do it and you're sincere about, like, the messages, you can find ways to help improve communities that are underrepresented. Um, you know, you, you, this idea of originalism in the Constitution has historically been interpreted through this idea of textualism where you have to read it very narrowly um, mm-hmm. to understand what the statute means. But I, I would look at originalism as like, no, um, like what Dworkin says, it's this idea of democracy for all and expanding the opportunity for everyone to participate. So under that idea, you know, with law, you can make sure that that happens um, at a faster rate through affecting actual statutes that are keeping Americans from thriving. Like, yeah. But you know, picketing and yelling about a million topics at once isn't going to do anything. Very true. Yeah, I was just like, I was just kind of curious, and I've been thinking about that in my own spare time. Yeah. But, but, um, but yeah, I was going to say that, uh, last thing I was going to say about this topic, about, like, uh, empathy and political discourse, I've always, I've noticed that, um, depending on which context I'm in, my political swing, my political stance and views always shift to the opposite of the general sentiment and the environment I'm in. Do you ever do that too, or do you do you tend to stay pretty much constant in your views? No, I'll I'll sometimes uh, swing. I remember when I was younger, I was pretty I was pretty immature and I was I was pretty conservative, um, just because I, you know, I was living in Northern Virginia and everyone was just like super liberal and I was just like I don't like this, like it's like mm-hmm. this counterculture thing. Um, there have been a couple times at school where I've heard heard some of my peers discuss very liberal policies. And I get fed up with either their, the way that they're trying to articulate themselves, um, not coming up with solutions, just identifying problems and being like super annoyed and being like, okay, like I can see why a conservative media or a conservative person would have zero tolerance for this kind of tomfoolery um, and this kind of just bullshit that this person's espousing without really giving anything to the other side or trying to meet in the middle. So I've definitely like, you know, if, if this is my aperture for my my uh, politics, like, it'll sometimes do, like, this. Mm, uh, yeah. Just just by the people. Yeah. That's one thing that I've definitely noticed in, like, med school and, like, in the Army. I remember being in the Army at, like, 375, and everybody is, like, a raging conservative there. And I was, like, I shifted to the straight up to the other side, the left side, and I was, like, talking, trying to bring counterpoints into the discussion. And then in med school, it's gone the other way where it's like my med school is way more liberal. So I've become more conservative, I've noticed, in my, a lot of my viewpoints just from the fact that I'm just trying to espouse like a contrasting viewpoint that I think. And I think that's like a good skill that I try to bring to every situation is just try to be the other, just try, try to argue the other side and just in any argument, just bring it, just playing, not necessarily the devil's advocate, but trying to argue it for the other side, seeing if you yeah, understand even- the situation. Even being aware of it, when, when Black Lives Matter was happening, I was in Afghanistan, um, and like I really hadn't paid too much attention at it to it mm-hmm. all. Again, having the privilege of being in the military and being right. kind of separated from this, this cultural phenomenon because everyone's equal in that organization, but again, not being directly impacted by it. And I'm not going to say who the 
this person was, but let's just say there was um, a person that made some pretty disparaging comments about the movement in general, and it like it sparked an interest in me to learn about Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. do more research, again, trying to identify this other side that I hadn't considered, have more empathy, and then it like it kind of angered me, like, man, like this person spoke with such disdain for this movement. Uh, this person spoke so negatively without having any appreciation for maybe some of the struggles or the obstacles that this student organization in Missouri was overcoming. And like, I was like, this is awful. Like, that's not, that's not good discourse. Mm -hmm. And it's such a bad example for every other person that probably heard that comment. Um, and just being like, like feeling really gross by the words that came out of this person's mouth and being like, okay, I never want to have that experience again. If I'm going to open my mouth and say something, like, you need to acknowledge that there's another point of view, but also be slightly informed, you know, to even have an opinion. Uh, right. Like, the idea of, like, you know, people have made, you should, like, voting, personal opinion, I don't think voting should just be a right. Like, there should be some, like, aptitude uh, test, and I'm not saying, like, you need to be able to do calculus, but, like, you need to be able to pass a basic, like, multiple choice quiz, who's running for office, what are their policies, and mm -hmm. do they have, like, fucked up kids? Uh, like, that could be a basic standard quiz to make sure that you're not just, like, wasting a vote. Uh, um, you sound like, like um, who is it? The Fatalist Papers, Monroe? Was it Monroe with the Fatalist Papers? Or Hamilton? Who is it? Hamilton. Hamilton? Well, a couple of people. I think it was uh, Hamilton. Was it Madison? There were three guys. Yeah. I just saw Hamilton too. Mob, mob, mobocracy was, didn't they say the term mobocracy? Was that was that Federalist Papers or something else? Uh, I don't remember that. I, I remember the Federalist Papers that I read were more focused on uh, economics and then the idea of uh, like state and, and federal rights. Oh, okay. Because I remember reading. I forget. Not personal. I don't, yeah, I don't remember when this was or what it was, but I just remember reading one of the Federalist Papers I, so long ago. It's been like ingrained in my memory. And it was like the term of like the democracy of the mob or something, and let it, like letting an uneducated mob essentially decide for America what the right decision is, and that was like very impactful in my development, in my like psyche, I think. Yeah, James Madison and, and Hamilton, and then a guy named John Jay. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know who John Jay is. But, but yeah, yeah man. Like... Hey, so, so next time, because we 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 got on a really cool topic here. Next time, though, and we've promised the people we should talk about Bullock. So okay. we'll talk about F.A. Bullock yeah. and I. Bullock and how to be successful at that. Um, yeah. And then we'll also get some feedback from some of our friends who are company commanders uh, about what not to do if you're a brand new lieutenant showing up to your unit. We've oh, talked good. about this before, right, yeah. but like how to engage with your company commander, not knowing if they're like, you know, a booger or not. Like, we'll talk yeah. that through. Okay, that, that, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I think we'll start wrapping up this week's episode. I think we got a little... I mean, it was a good discussion, I think. I, I, I thoroughly yeah. enjoy when we start going off in the, kind of in the deep end, like examining some things. I think yeah. I get a lot out of it, uh, just thinking about things, because you definitely offer different perspectives from a lot of things than I do. I think we balance it out pretty well, because I think... Actually, I don't even know. Like, I don't even. I think I call you more liberal than conservative. I think I'm a little, right now I'm a little more conservative than liberal, so I think it's, we have a good like uh, mirroring of or contrasting of views, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I noticed that, you know, and you, and for those that are listening, you notice we don't call each other, like, Snowflake or Boomer. You know. Okay, Boomer. Well, I can <laughs> call you Boomer now because you're older than 30. I know, I'm older than 30. Old but piece yeah. of shit. But this is how you have a political discussion without getting emotional and having actual good discussions. Yeah, I have tissues next to me uh, just waiting to end this call so I can cry. I can cry. Because you, you've <laughs> liberal <offended> tears, <laughs> liberal tears, crocodile yeah. tears. But yeah, well, that's a great. We'll, we'll end with this, and then um, next week we'll, that's a good point. We we'll talk about some bullock stuff, and then uh, talk about some tips for a second fresh lieutenant showing up to your first first unit. I think we'll get a yeah. lot of good feedback from that. And not just like first lieutenant, not, not like first second lieutenant showing up, just like guys showing up to your unit first time, and just in general. I think we can talk. I think we can talk about that in general. I feel like. Yeah, maybe we'll like hint if you're. Like getting ready to go to RASP, what it's going to be like when you show up to your mm -hmm. uh, company and uh, 
the lottery system about who gets uh, put into what platoon and, you know, lottery system. what some, yeah, what some of our practices were with who had first pick between uh. the platoons for guys. <laughs> that was a real, uh, let's just say if you were an Eagles fan, that came down to a legitimate decision between like two Rangers that we had available. And that was the, that was how the determination was made who was oh, coming God. to first platoon. I just, I just love being the fly on the wall for the platoon drafts, and you guys showed up. I just love sitting yeah. there in the cough, just watching it, because it was like, I feel like multiple times, like almost fist, it almost came to fists. Like people, platoons are almost start fighting over guys. It was hilarious. Yeah, especially if you were good looking and had like a good flow, like coming right out of rasp. Like, you know, again, I think good hair speaks uh, generally to your level of success, and so uh, people, people, I don't associated I was, that with some things. I'll take that tip with a grain of salt for everybody listening. Cause I don't, I wouldn't, that would not be one of my tips of the, the showing up to your first unit is having a fucked up haircut. Yeah. You don't have a fucked up haircut, but yeah. if you have a great haircut, you know, you just all the better, but, but yeah. yeah. And then next week too, uh, we'll announce like the charity of the month for May. Very true. And then we'll close up with that. Um, but yeah, I don't really necessarily have anything closing comments wise besides, you know, check out, uh, the website. We, ha- for those that are asking, there is now a book list, a book list, excuse me, on the website. So if you're looking for stuff to read, we have some books up there. Feel free to hit us up if you have any other suggestions or things that we could check out. Um, but there's the books on there on the website, are just like books that we both have enjoyed, and I think that um, you can get something out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's all I have. Yeah, that's all I got, man. I'll uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later today, anyway. So. <laughs> Until next time, guys and guys Until and girls. Later. Bye. Peace.